Hey everyone and welcome to WCN's Closer Look. We are so excited to have you here today, especially since it's a Friday evening um, and you're here to learn about conservation. So we're just super excited to have you. I am Caitlin Tillett. I am the Senior Manager of D Digital Marketing for Wildlife Conservation Network and today I get to be your host. So a little bit of logistics before we dive into today's, into today's presentation. After the presentation, we'll have time for Q&A, so please go ahead and use the chat at any time throughout today's talk to pop in your questions. We'll be keeping a close eye on the chat and gathering those questions to ask to Louisa and Salisa at the end of this talk. Also, feel free, I see some of you guys are saying hi in the chat, we love that. Please go ahead and say hi, see where, um, and say where you're tuning in from tonight. And as a reminder, we are recording today's talk and we will be posting this on YouTube later and we will share that link with you. So if you have any friends that are interested in marine conservation, we highly encourage you to share the recording with them. So now it is my pleasure to get to introduce our speakers to you today. Dr. Louisa Panampalam is the executive director and co-founder of the Maraset Research Organization. Maraset is Malaysia's first and only nonprofit organization dugong to dolphin, dugong, and whale conservation. Louisa works hard to raise the profile of marine mammals in Malaysia and to build and inspire our local research and conservation capacity for these animals in their fragile marine environment. In 2014, Louisa was awarded the Pew Fellowship in Marine Conservation, the first Malaysian ever to win this prestigious international award, as well as the National Youth Premier Award from the Malaysian government. Louisa trains and mentors young conservationists from in Malaysia to follow in her footsteps. She will be joined later today during the Q&A by Dr. Saliza Bono, who is the acoustic lead for Marasat's bycatch mitigation project, which we're gonna hear lots more about today. In 2022, mm -hmm. Saliza completed her PhD research on acoustic ecology for the Indo-Pacific humpback, humpback dolphins and the Irrawaddy Ir 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 Do dolphins at Kyoto University in Japan. Salisa is passionate to fill the knowledge gaps on marine mammal acoustic ecology in Malaysia and contribute to Marset's growing research and conservation efforts. So now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Louisa. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, it's really nice to uh, to be here today to present a little bit about our work uh, in Malaysia. I'm really happy to to be dialing in from um, Kuala Lumpur, and as Caitlin mentioned, and thank you for the introduction. I'm joined today by Saliza, our bioacoustics officer. Um, I'm really enjoying seeing um, all the place names in the chat. So it's it's nice to know. Um, lots of people from the other side of the world have, have uh, tuned in to listen to, to us today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now so that we can get the presentation underway. Um, your screen. Share. You need to unmute, Louisa, so we see your screen. All right, so back to this. Okay, I hope everybody can see my screen and hear me clearly. Uh, today, I would like to give a short presentation that I've titled Bananas and Bycatch, Finding Local Solutions to a Global Problem. Um, this project that we are currently doing here in Malaysia, or this program, is being led by Dr. Vivian Quitt, our scientific officer. Um, but she couldn't be here today with us as she's currently in the field. Um, but we've got um, Saliza with us um, for questions and answers later. So maybe you might be wondering, what does bananas have to do with uh, bycatch? And I will reveal to you in a little while. Um, before I go on, I just wanted to sort of uh, 
preempt all of you to say that there will be images uh, or some videos in this presentation that might not be such a sort of a peachy uh, picture um, and it might be sort of maybe distressing to some of you, um, but unfortunately, this is the reality of the issue of bycatch, uh, which is the accidental uh, capture or accidental entanglement um, of marine mammals in fishing gear. So um, please bear with me as we go through the presentation, um, but I hope that we can present a, a comprehensive view of the work that we're doing and how we're trying to aid in this global problem locally. So when we think about marine mammals, when we think about dolphins and porpoises, what, what is invoked in our minds basically are images of dolphins jumping, leaping out of the water, making a splash, such as this Indo-Pacific humpback dolphin that we have in um, Langkawi, where we worked for the last decade and a little bit. Um, this particular one actually is nicknamed Sandra in our catalog. And when we think about marine mammals, we also think about them just sw swimming freely out in the open sea in large groups. You can see up in the top right corner, a finless porpoise with its uh, calf, right? We think about um, the fact that the sea is vast and they are able to just roam wherever they need to roam and swim around and be social with each other in their pod and live their best lives as marine mammals. Same thing here. These are Irrawaddy dolphins, also another species that we work with here in Malaysia. Um, and again, these are images that are very typical when we say the word dolphin or porpoises or even whales for that matter. Groups of animals breaking the surface, exhaling um, their breaths, making a splash. However, as much as that is the image that we are usually uh, invoked with when we, we hear those words, dolphins, whales, porpoises, the reality is that these animals are greatly endangered and threatened all over the world. This is an infographic uh, resulting from a scientific paper of which I was a part of, led by my colleague, Dr. Jill Brolick. Um, and basically we examined the red list status an extinction risk of the world's whales, dolphins, and porpoises. I just wanted to draw your attention to this pie chart in the middle. Basically, to summarize, it says one in four cetacean species all around the world are threatened with extinction. And this means being listed either as vulnerable to extinction, endangered, or critically endangered. If we zoom in further into the uh, geographic patterns of extinction risk, then Southeast Asia, where we are right here in Malaysia, is a global hotspot of extinction risks of various species of cetaceans, um, whales, dolphins, and porpoises, uh, in particular for seven uh, species. And when we zoom in to that closer, we find that the Irrawaddy dolphin the finless porpoise and the humpback dolphins are among the list uh, of cetacean species with that high global extinction risk within this Southeast Asia hotspot for extinction risk. And these are the three species that I've just shown pictures of um, just in the slides before. So basically, these animals are threatened with extinction and therefore the work that we are doing here in Malaysia is incredibly important because we're working with species that, are, that have a high extinction risk in an area where there is a high extinction risk due to um, many uh, human activities that are intertwined with their habitat. Now, in another scientific publication published in 2021, um, a group of scientists led by uh, Dr. Temple examined the bycatch risk for toothed whales in global small-scale fisheries. And if you look to the uh, blue, blue square here um, in the map, again, this is an area where you can see it's red, which means that the bycatch risk throughout Southeast Asia, throughout most of Asia actually, um, is incredibly high. And through their research, 
they also found that the three species I just mentioned, humpback dolphins, Phyllis porpoises, and Irrawaddy dolphins are among the top 10 list of species, cetacean species, with the highest global bycatch risks. So again, we're dealing with species that are um, threatened very much with bycatch, which means that they're being caught in nets, um, or the risk of them being caught in nets is very high, um, by accident, of course, and as well as the extinction risk as a result of that is also uh, high. Now, why are marine mammals all over the world threatened um, with extinction um, uh, it, through bycatch? Why are they getting bycaught in fishing gear? Um, I think one of the main reasons is because of, you know, our human beings' insatiable uh, appetite for seafood and seafood resources. Uh, and that means that there are a lot more nets of all sorts in the water in all over the world because there is this demand for seafood. So when there is more nets in the water, of course, the risk of any animal getting accidentally caught in these nets is going to go up, right? Um, so for example, um, this is the vaquita and it is currently the world's most endangered marine mammal. Um, there are only about 10 or less left, I think, at the last count that scientists did. This vaquita is found only in the upper Gulf of California um, in Mexico. And um, the reason for its decline to critically endangered status right now is because of entanglement in fishing gear. Um, it's a really complex topic and there are many, many people working to, to resolve this issue. But I just wanted to point out that um, the issue of bycatch has that ability to drive a species towards extinction. And that's why here at Marset and many other people all around the world, we are working hard to try and address this issue of how can we all get our seafood supply, um, but still not have it be detrimental to the non-target species that share the habitat in the sea um, with, with the catch that you know, we, we want to catch for consumption. So just to show you, this is a video from one of our sites here in Malaysia up in the northwestern part of Peninsula Malaysia. And you can see those flags in the in the video. And this is also, you can see a large pod of um, humpback dolphins that are just engaged in traveling behavior. What that green flag that you see in the water is, is actually a marker, a marker for one end of a fishing net, for a drift net that's been left to soak in the water for for a period of time um, before the fisherman comes back to collect his catch. Now, on this day, of course, uh, the dolphins are just traveling past the net and none are getting entangled or caught by accident. They're just moving past the net and that's not an issue. But I just wanted to highlight how nets and dolphins, porpoises, and even whales basically share the sea, sea water column and that space together all the time. If you look at the frame here, you can see smaller uh, flags in the distance closer to the horizon. So each net is marked by one flag at each end. And, and so you can see that there are quite a number of um, fishing nets actually just within this frame. Now, this is a Indo-Pacific finless porpoise that was found on the beach um, by a beach goer some years ago. And you can see that the animal no longer has its tail. Usually for us, this is the biggest telltale sign that the animal was unfortunately a victim of bycatch. Because if an animal is still alive, the fisherman will definitely try to release the animal safely from his net. However, if the animal is already dead when, when it is found in the net, the easiest way for the fisherman to dislodge the animal from his net um, without damaging his net further would be to just chop it off at the tail. Yeah, so sometimes we come across cases like that and then that's when we know, okay, this animal most likely um, died from being caught in a net. Um, and here's another video uh, which we recorded last year in one of our field sites as well. Uh, our team was um, 
doing field work and uh, when we suddenly noticed that there was this animal dolphins splashing around at the net um, and luckily for it the fishermen noticed it very uh, early on and proceeded to uh, disentangle it from the net um, and securely released it safely so it took a while because the animal was also struggling um, but finally um, thank goodness uh, the dolphin was uh, released safely and it swam off and in the distance, actually, our team noticed that there was another dolphin sort of waiting for its for its mate. And then they, they swam off uh, together after that. Um, the fishermen who managed to um, disentangle the dolphin successfully uh, informed our team that his net suffered pretty bad damages afterwards and he would have to go and fix it. So given that bycatch is happening um, in our sites, right, we've seen many... Uh, evidence of the occurrence of bycatch happening to the cetaceans in the areas where we work. Um, since last year, uh, we decided to embark on this uh, project that we're calling our Marine Mammal Bycatch Mitigation Project. Now, we're using a device called the Banana Pinger. Um, so can you tell which is the banana and which is the pinger? So as for obvious reasons, it is called a banana pinger because um, it is enveloped in a silicon casing that is shaped like a banana and it's bright yellow in color. Um, these come from the UK. Um, and so we're working with local fishermen. We're trying to engage them to put these on fishing gear so that uh, it can help deter dolphins or porpoises from coming towards the net. So we've got Dr. Saliza here holding a uh, hydromoth, an acoustic recorder, and Dr. Vivian, our science officer, holding the banana pinger. And this is out in our field site in Para. Um, and how it works, what we're trying to do here with our bycatch uh, mitigation trials is one is to distribute these banana pingers to local fishermen and have them install it on their nets and tell us how effective it's been and whether they've seen a reduction in bycatch or um, in dolphins uh, approaching their nets less or depredating it. So one of the things I just want to backtrack to mention that not only is this project trying to um, address the issue of bycatch and finding ways to overcome it, we also want it to be a win-win solution for the fishers. Sometimes uh, dolphins might not get they get caught because they come close to the nets and they try to steal fish off from the nets. And sometimes if they're unlucky, they get stuck and entangled it, in it. And so uh, fishermen not only lose their catch, they also have their nets damaged. So the idea of this program really is to do two things, to prevent dolphins from coming close to the nets so that it reduces their bycatch risk, as well as to reduce the catch loss uh, of, of the, the catch of the fishermen through depredation, dolphins coming to take their catch, as well as to minimize or avoid any kind of unnecessary damage to the fishing gear. Um, so for this project that we're doing here in Malaysia, what we're doing is to, as I mentioned, provide pingers to the fishermen, but also to try and observe it ourselves, what the effect of a pinger in the water would be um, for dolphins. And that's where the acoustic recorder comes in. So what we do when we are out on field surveys is we have this pole attached to some a, a weighted buoy uh, and underneath we attach the pinger uh, as well as this hydromorph, which is basically an acoustic recorder. The pinger only activates once it's in the water and it pings out um, noise, a ping, at frequencies that are beyond our hearing range. But uh, um, it should be able to be heard by the cetaceans, um, but not the fish. So we put this in whenever we have a sighting of dolphins for purposes. Um, and we, we try to visually observe the animal's behavior, um, whether they are attracted towards this pole or if they swim away uh, and the acoustic recorder is already attached to the pole underwater recording any kind of uh, vocalizations or sounds that the animals may make in relation to the pings being um, put out every few seconds. 
So in terms of the pingers being placed on fishing gear, this is sort of what it looks like. Of course, different gears, different kind of placement. But the idea is that there are pingers attached to the net, right? And of course, fish are going into the net. But because it is emitting this loud, very high frequency sound, um, it's meant to help alert the dolphins that, okay, there is a net there, um, don't come near. But it's also meant to try and keep them away from approaching the nets again so that fishermen don't lose their catch from depredation and it keeps the dolphin safe. So over the last year, um, our team has gone around to many, many fishing villages, speaking to local fishermen and trying to explain to them about this program, asking them about bycatch, you know, whether they, they have bycatch, whether they've seen bycatch in their, um, in their fishery, uh, and to try and uh, get them to participate in this bycatch mitigation trial. So... Just focusing on the banana pingers, because there are other pingers that we are also using for the program. Um, so far, we have had eight fishers uh, participating in this program, whereby 47 banana pingers have been distributed for them to trial out. Uh, we have a team on site to uh, communicate with these fishers uh, frequently to get updates from them about how the pingers are doing, uh, if there have been any changes reported, if there are any bycatch and etc. And as of February 2024, we have another eight more fishers who uh, have been recruited to join the program and um, we have to get more pingers to be able to distribute to these fishers. We are hoping to get more fishermen participating in this throughout our field site. Um, of course, in the beginning, it was quite tough to explain everything to them and to sort of overcome their skepticism of this program. Uh, some were a bit hesitant because they thought it might be inconvenient to them. Some were hesitant because they, they were afraid that they would get into trouble if um, they had bycatch and stuff like that. Uh, and so luckily we had one or two local fishers whom we already knew from you know, the years of working in the area who were willing to try it. And many of their fisher friends would say, okay, well, we'll let him go first. We'll let him try first. And if it works, uh, I'll, I'll try. So, so far it's been quite encouraging because um, from we've had eight fishers and now eight more um, are on board. And we're hoping that through word of mouth um, and good feedback from the fishers, uh, we'll be able to recruit even more of them to trial this out with the idea that we want to see if it works because if it doesn't work, then we have to find other ways. And if it doesn't, uh, and if it works, we want to be able to try and scale it up across the country, working together with um, all local stakeholders as well as the authorities. So this is just to show you what it looks like on one of the uh, Fisher participants nets. Um, this is a gill net um, or drift net that's left to soak unattended for several hours um, before it's retrieved. And um, I can just play that again for you. Uh, so they place a few of them uh, along the nets that are very, very long. And um, we get them to tell us, was it effective? We get them to tell us how many did they fix on their net? How long was their net? You know, do they need more because one or two wasn't enough for the entire net? Or did they think it was sufficient? Um, there are pingers of different decibels or different loudness. Um, and we, we have them trial um, the pingers at different loudness uh, and frequencies as well, so that we are able to tell what works and maybe what doesn't work. So to date, what we know from the feedback given by the local fishers who are participating is that uh, the pingers, the ban banana pingers seem to be effective on Indo-Pacific humpback dolphins. Um, and the fishers are reporting that the dolphins are, you know, either staying away um, or, yeah, they're just not coming close to the nets and there's, you know, much less depredation. And of course, they haven't had bycatch uh, in a while. And in fact, when we uh, deploy, the few times that we've deployed the 
pole with the weighted buoy with the pinger and the acoustic recorder, what we observed was that the dolphins moved away quite quickly. Uh, there was a time when a, a small group of young dolphins, like juvenile group, seemed attracted just for a few seconds. They came towards it, but then very quickly after that, they, they also left very quickly. So what we know is that one, the dolphins can hear the pings um, and, and they respond to it. And two, it appears that the dolphins do move away. However, uh, with the finless porpoise, unfortunately, it seems to be ineffective for the finless porpoise so far because we have sampled um, from fishermen who had pingers on their nets and fishermen who didn't have pingers on their nets and both are still getting bycatch of finless porpoises uh, in their nets. Um, in fact, there was one case where uh, the animal, uh, when we did the necropsy, the post-mortem, we found a um, small little fetus inside one of the uh, porpoises. So that was quite sad. But what we're finding is that, yeah, we, we need to figure out how to adjust the uh, pinger or what other method can we use to, to look at the um, effectiveness uh, of a certain pinger for finless porpoises. Yeah. So this is what we'll be working on this year, trying to uh, figure that out, trying to see if it's the, the equipment that we adjust or if it's the sound frequency or if we have to use a totally different approach. So another thing that we do as part of this program is to have knowledge sharing workshops and capacity building workshops with the local fishermen in the village. Uh, we've run two of such workshops uh, since the commencement of this program. Um, and we basically share with them information on how to safely disentangle the animal so that we um, try to optimize the animal's welfare as well as to minimize damage as well to the fishing gear uh, and we also uh, share information with them about stranding response what to do if they saw a stranded marine mammal either uh, washed ashore or at sea what can they do to assist us with data collection and it is also at these workshops that we try to uh, share uh, latest results and updates of the bycatch mitigation program and where we try to recruit more fishers to join the program. Yeah, and we try to get the ones who are already participating to provide some testimonials and to share with us their experience of how it's been like um, using those pingers that we provided to them. And so, I mean, you know, of course, it's a pretty grim topic. Uh, it's hard to to sort of see, but I think there is light at the end of the tunnel. I think it's, uh, I'm really happy that we are able to do this program and it's nice to be able to get feedback such as these from the fisher participants. One said, since installing pingers, when we see dolphins now, we don't have to play tug of war with them anymore. So there's no tussle between them and the dolphins. And another one said, since installing pingers, we do not see the dolphins depredating our nets anymore. But at the same time, we saw that other fishers who did not install pingers had to play tug of war with the dolphins and their nets have holes from the dolphins depredating their nets. So this is pretty encouraging because it, it, when we started, a lot of the local fishers were quite hesitant. They never heard of a pinger. And the last thing they wanted was any kind of trouble with bycatch or being um, penalized for something that happened by accident and etc. And it's really nice to see that more and more are coming on board. They've been really cooperative to provide us with the information that we need to assess the efficiency uh, and the effectiveness of these pingers. Uh, in fact, we've seen an increase in um, bycatch being reported uh, to us. And I think it's because one, it's trust and two, uh, the fishers now know about this program, they know about us, and so they're able to inform us when, when such incidents happen. Uh, previously, a lot of these bycatch incidences go unreported and often the fishermen would just discard the animal at sea before coming back to shore because it's heavy and you know they wouldn't want to have to drag that all the way back to shore. So it's really nice to see that um, this participation and interaction that we can have with the local fishermen and to have that information uh, be supplied to us um, and for us to be able to help them 
um, and of course, uh, sort of move dolphin conservation in, in the direction that it needs to go. Um, so I just want to end on this happier note. Um, you know, this is how we envision our world. This is how we envision um, the animals that we work with, the dolphins. You know, we hope that they will always be swimming wild and free out at sea, free from any kind of threat, um, free from any kind of risk of being caught in a net or going extinct. Um, and so we will continue doing this work. And I think that with your support, uh, we can certainly do so much more um, through this program and through all the other programs that we, we run here at Marset. Um, we have plans to purchase more pingers, um, to distribute to more fisher participants, uh, and we're hoping to look into the issue of why the pingers are not effective for finless purposes. So we value everybody's support and um, we hope that you will rally behind us to make this a success so that dolphins, porpoises, whales, even dugongs uh, that are not uh, featured in today's presentation will always swim wild and free in our waters. So uh, with that, thank you so much. Oh, I think I was muted there. I think I was muted there. <laughs> Louisa, we're hearing that echo on your no, on your screen. Yeah. So awesome. Thank you so much, Louisa. Um, it's really wonderful to hear all the updates that you and your team are doing um in the field. So I just wanted to remind you all, we are now entering into our QA time. So please go ahead and um pop your questions into that chat. And we'll start um, diving into them with Louisa and Salisa. So I see that Annalise um, has um, a question. So do the set of nets at night work? I know for C do the set of nets at night work? I know for seabirds it could help, but not sure about marine mammals. Um, to answer, thank you for the question. Just to answer the question, I think, yes, uh, it should work because as long as the dolphins or the porpoises can hear the pingers, um, then they respond a certain way. So uh, the pingers, as long as the pingers are in the water and the battery hasn't run out and the batteries can last for quite a while, uh, it should be pinging, you know, whenever it's in the water. So whether it's daytime, nighttime, uh, so as long as it's pinging uh, and the animals can hear it, then it should work, whether night or day. Great, thanks, Louisa. Um, and then Anne is asking, why do you think certain species do not do not find the pingers aversive? Um, I'll answer that question. Thank you so much for your question. And usually, the pingers uh, would ping at a certain frequency from fifty uh, fifty. 50 kilohertz to 120 kilohertz around there. And uh, they'll ping at different frequencies uh, in that range. So depending on what species, uh, different species have different hearing uh, frequency range. So porpoises, for example, are really high frequency over 100 kilohertz. And so it depends on the species and whether the pingers affect them or not, depending on the spe uh, hearing range of that animal. And Salisa, one other question about the pingers. Why are they yellow for a reason? Or does that is it just because banana shape and they want to call them banana pingers? Is there any reason for the color? Um, no, I don't think there's a reason for a color. There's also a different um a different uh, louder one that's in red color. So yeah, I think they just put it that color. Great. And then um, another question I actually wanted to ask both of you, if you don't mind sharing. Um, many of you guys know March is International Women's Month, and we're so fortunate to have two incredible women in conservation here with us today. So I'd love to know, how did you start working in marine mammal um, conservation? And what uh, what should someone interested in, oh, sorry, and what, like, how would you inspire somebody who uh, might be interested in pursuing this career? Like, how could they get started? So Lisa, you want to go or shall I? Okay. Um, 
you know, I think uh, one one thing is that, uh, of course, what drives us to this field to begin with, I think, is a deep love, passion and interest for the natural world as well as the environment. When we have that deep love and passion, of course, we feel compelled to do something about it. And that's how we, you know, sort of eventually sort of stumble into this conservation field. It is um, pretty much a largely unconventional field, especially over here in Asia. Um, and I think uh, a lot of you know how to, to go about it is to read up. Uh, if, if you're just about to go into university, if you have a gap year or some free time, I would say try to get involved in conservation initiatives locally. There are a lot of groups uh, who offer volunteering opportunities because I think that there is a there is a sometimes a misconception about what conservation work entails you know it's the whole like what I think I do what my parents think I do what my friends think I do and what I really do right um, and I think all of us in the team have had to learn that that way where we, we had an idea of what we thought we would be doing or want to do and I think the work that we we, the opportunities that we get with this work is amazing, but it's also really hard going because like for us, we spend lots of time in the field under the hot sun, in the rain, in the wind, etc. And then after that, we have to process data, you know, uh, wash equipment, crunch numbers, etc, etc. So, um, and then we, you know, on the other hand, we also have to have a lot of discussions with local stakeholders, whether it's local community groups, uh, government agencies, uh, uh, other NGOs, anybody from the local community. Um, and so there's a diverse range of things that we have to do. So I would say if you're interested in a certain conservation topic or in a certain taxa of wildlife, that's wonderful. Um, but it would be great to be able to get a bit of firsthand experience working in this line before deciding whether it's really for you. We've had volunteers come on board um, on our surveys and they're really excited. They're like, I'm going to go on and be a marine biologist. I want to be a marine conservationist. And by the end of um, the whole experience, they loved it, but then they realized that it's not not so much for them, but that, but that they would come back to volunteer their time again and again, but that they would pursue something else uh, for, for their career. And there've been people who like, basically it cemented their interest uh, and, and desire to, to do this kind of work as a full-time job, as a full-time career. So I, I would say experience, um, getting your hands on experience is important just to be sure that this is what you want to do. Um, I think I'll just add on as well. Yeah, it's true that um, passion really is what drives us into conservation. As a young, uh, as a young girl, um, I saw dolphins for my very first time, and I knew since then that I wanted to study them. But of course, um, at that very young age, I didn't know that oh, they need saving and things like that. So I went on to study marine science um, in Australia, and I studied a lot about uh, the ocean, the marine life, and things like that. But again, as Dr. Luisa mentioned, it's all about volunteering um, and learning about uh, different conservation fields. So I knew that I wanted to do marine mammals, but of course I volunteered in other fields in marine science as well. So like turtles, um, seagrass, corals, fish, and all things like that. And I knew still that I'm very interested in marine mammals. And from learning from all these different research teams, I got to know that um, conservation is a very big part of it. So I also volunteered actually for Mariset. Um, that's how I knew about Mariset. And that's when I knew that I could do something uh, with the marine mammal conservation in Malaysia. And uh, I knew that I would really be uh, like wanting to help and learn more from the Mariset team. So that's how I'm here. That's great. Um, thank you both so much for those answers. Um, let me just... It, um, so Innocent's asking, I am very curious to hear about the dolphins and bananas and how um, and how you work with the fishermen. So yeah, if you could just kind of talk about that process and what challenges you may have with working with the local fishermen. Um, yeah, that would be great. Sure. Make sure I didn't miss it. Yeah, any. so basically we we go to, uh, we currently for this program, we work in the state of Para. Um, and uh, we started by going through to all the different fishing villages 
to identify what kind of fishing gear was being used um, and whether it would be suitable for us to uh, engage with the, the local fishermen that were using those particular gears. Uh, we would speak to the local fishermen, you know, those that we could find at the jetty, at the, at the coffee, uh, coffee shops, just having a cup of tea. And we'd sit there and chat with them about whether they've seen dolphins or porpoises, how often do they go out, what kind of gear do they use, um, have they ever gotten a uh, bycatch, uh, you know, what species, how often, etc. So we try to get a broad overview first of the situation in each village, and then we try to uh, introduce the concept of pingers. We, we brought along the banana pinger with us uh, to show them and explain to them how it works uh, and and why, why we want to try it out and how we need their help um, to try it out for us so that we can see if it works and we can try to you know in, introduce it to more people um, within the fishing communities here. Uh, and then we would explain to them what they needed to do if they participated, uh, what they st stood to gain from participating in our program. Uh, so it usually was a little bit, it, you know, it's like breaking ice. Sometimes it's not easy uh, and you have to build that trust with the, with the fishing community because obviously they're just having their cup of coffee or tea when all of a sudden we approach their table and, and so you can imagine it could be a bit overwhelming like who are these people and what do they want with me so I think establishing a conversation is important and um, uh, presenting your intentions sincerely and genuinely is important and I think bringing along the banana pinger uh, helped a lot uh, with sort of getting the message across of what we were trying to do in some places we also uh we learned that uh, in order to scare away, uh, these are for more offshore fisheries, in order to scare away the dolphins that would come and try to steal fish off of the nets, the fishermen would use dynamite, would throw dynamite into the water to cause a large sort of blast noise so that the dolphins would stay away. But some of them have lost fingers in the process because they didn't manage to, you know, throw the dynamite out from their hands before it exploded. So these are one of the things that we try to say, okay, well, how about trying pingers? It's a lot safer. You don't have to risk losing your fingers, etc. So it really depends on the situation and listening, hearing them out first, and then uh, gauging, okay, uh, should we engage with them? Would they be interested to engage with them? And uh, uh, once they are onboarded into our program, then we have a team on site who visit the local fishers uh, regularly, I think every week, uh, and uh, would try to collect data on um, when they went out with the pingers, how many they installed, did they observe any depredation, any bycatch, uh, did they observe if the dolphins were sort of repelled by the sound of the pingers, etc. So we're, we're collecting all that information right now to be able to see how efficient it is and then kind of come back to the drawing board like we like we have to with the fiddler's purposes to see um, how can we do better, yeah. Great, we're, ha we're getting some more questions in the chat. So thank you guys for coming. A few questions around collaboration. Are you working with any other ma uh, marine mammal conservation organizations within Malaysia? And are you, um, are you guys collaborating on the implementation of projects such as the banana pingers? So at the moment, um, because this is pretty much a pilot program, we are we are working with the local communities uh, as well as the um, government authorities or so the Department of Fisheries, uh, Malaysia. We have their support for this program. Um, they have had officers come and attend our community workshops for stranding response and disentanglement uh, procedures. So um, there isn't like a collaboration per se yet with any other organizations. Uh, and I think also because the project itself is quite new and we're just trying to get our footing, but we definitely work very closely with the local communities in the villages where we are operating the program. Uh, and we have the um, support uh, and the endorsement of our Department of Fisheries. Yeah. Great, thank you. And a question from Innocent, do you have, um, is there incidents of poaching among the fishermen and how do you control legal activities that can disturb your program? 
Um, so far, we haven't had any uh, reports of poaching. Um, we just have had the fishermen report to us any bycatch that they had. Um, and now that we have a team on site in Para, uh, we are able to receive the carcasses of those bycaught animals if the fishermen do bring them back to shore. Yeah, so it's really just um, accidental entanglement as far as we are aware. Um, and, you know, that's, that's it's, it's accident. So it's not uh, something that is, um, I guess, penalized in, in that sense, because it happened by accident. So I think some fishermen are still uh, nervous about reporting bycatch because they still feel like maybe they would get into trouble. But we've also had the opportunity to, whenever we speak to them, we do tell them like, hey, it would really help if you could report any bycatch because it, it helps us with our data collection to be able to dis determine um, where these things are happening and if there are certain fishermen that we should sort of approach for this uh, bycatch trial, etc. So we really try to ensure them that they're not going to get in trouble if they tell us about bycatch because obviously that happened by accident. But yeah, no poaching um, as far as we know so far because uh, fishermen know that marine mammals are protected by law in Malaysia. So it is illegal to hunt them and poach them and, and do all those kinds of things. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, thank you. And it sounds like the reporting of bycatch has been increasing as you've been like establishing those relationships with fishermen. Um, switching gears a bit to speak more and talk more about the animals. Can you or how do you identify any individual dolphins? And do you guys, if you can identify them, do you have any favorites that you currently are studying? So um, how we identify individual dolphins. So we actually, when we're out there and we see a group of dolphins, we take photos of their dorsal fin, uh, their fin at the back, and we take photos of the left side and right side. So, and then we go back home, we download the photos, and then we look at all those photos and we match them. Uh, we compare all these fins to previous photos and to our uh, existing catalog. And we look at the different uh, uh, notches and different uh, pigmentation, the shape and things like that. And this is called, this process is called photo identification. And this is actually done um, by all marine mammal researchers around the world with all different species of dolphins out there. So in terms of the finless porpoise, however, the Indo-Pacific finless porpoises, as its name suggests, it's finless. So they're much more harder or actually impossible to identify individuals because they don't have a fin. So those we don't do photo identification on. Um, but yes, so the humpback dolphins that we see, we identify them you know, using their dorsal fins and their pigmentation and notches as well. And a favorite, mm, I would say flop because uh, flop is very easy to um, flop is very easy to uh, see out there. So when we see flop around, we'll know instantly that it's flop. And it's named flop because uh, actually it we don't know well we don't know if it was. Uh, entangled in a net or uh, it was uh, the pro boat propeller cut its fin but its fin has cut off and it was it flops over to the side and so actually when flop is swimming really fast the fin actually flops on the side yeah oh that sounds so cute uh louisa is flop also your favorite or do you have a different different favorite um, yeah, Flop is definitely a, a crowd favorite, definitely is one of my favorites as well. Um, but uh, one of my favorites is also Grace. Um, Grace is a dolphin whose dorsal fin is pretty much gone and the tips of her tail flukes are also sort of cut off. So she must have been caught in some unpleasant situation in her past in the past and somehow survived all those trauma of losing her fin and the tips of her dos uh, of her tail flukes um, and I named her Grace because um, basically Grace is a mother she's gone on to survive these traumatic events in her life and reproduce we've seen her with young calves uh, over the different years and so we know that she's been somehow a survivor who's able to have been go on to live a normal life, live her best dolphin life, reproduce, have babies. So I named her Grace because I like the song Amazing Grace. I think Grace is quite amazing. Um, yeah, and then there's also 
uh, some dolphins that we've seen since and we've been following since 2010. Um, and we've seen them throughout the years, one of them being another female named Pink Steps. So she's one of my favorites just simply because she was one of the early regulars that we kept seeing from a, more than a decade ago. Yeah, but we have like hundreds of animals in our catalog and uh, definitely some, like as Saliza mentioned, some do stand out. Um, and because they're also very distinctive, their, their dorsal fins are e either very heavily pigmented with a very distinctive pattern or it's been severed cut off there's a big gash in there or something um so they're easy to remember and then we see them um quite often throughout the years so it's it's quite remarkable to be able to track some of these individuals for over a decade and to see where they go where they like hanging out how many babies they've had in the last decade um and just seeing them survive traumatic events in their life yeah so and I think that's what keeps us and personally keeps me going is to see their resilience. You know, um, if if they are somehow able to be resilient and uh, overcome these sort of threats that are thrown to them in, in their natural habitat as a result of human activity, then I feel personally um, obliged to work even harder to ensure that they can survive into the future, that there is a future for them to live in. Um, and um, and, and just because they're resilient doesn't mean we have to sort of uh, relax and say, oh, they'll be fine, they'll survive. I think we, we need to do our part to ensure that they and their offspring have that chance at surviving well into the future um, for future generations. Thank you. Yeah, that sounds like it'd be incredibly rewarding. Another question from the chat. This will probably be our last question. Then we'll need to wrap some stuff up. Um, how has your program improved the lives of those fishermen and um, other local communities around there compared to before you started? Um, I think it's uh, a bit too early to, to sort of say like, oh, it's had a huge impact. But I think... Um, if based on some of the testimonials we've received from the, the fishermen who participate in this program, it does sound like there's a number of them who can finally see the, the advantage of having pingers on their nets. Uh, they've said that they've had to tussle with dolphins much less and they see their, their peers, their counterparts who didn't have pingers installed on the nets struggling with either uh, lost catch because of depredation, you know, dolphins stealing catch off their nets or net damage because they, they do get entanglement and they have to disentangle the animal. And it costs them time. You know, it's not just about um, the dolphin getting caught in the net and then the net being damaged. It costs them time and opportunity because when they have to, and money, of course, they have to spend money to fix their nets and then they have to spend the time to fix the nets, which means that they don't get to spend that time being out at sea to catch fish, to be able to earn money. So they really wouldn't like to have dolphins getting caught in their nets and damaging their nets. So I think that more and more fishers are starting to see that this is quite a beneficial thing for them and um, that it can save them a lot of trouble in the long run. And I think they're telling their friends about it over coffee uh, in the evenings or over supper. And I think more are interested to participate. So um, I think in that way, maybe it's been, it's changed their life, but I think it's too early to sort of say that it's been sort of life changing in, in, in that grand scale. Well, we're excited to continue to hear updates over the next few years, see the long-term effects that it's making. Um, so we're winding down now. I wanted to give a chance to Luisa and Salisa to just share any final thoughts and ways that we can help support your work. Um, yeah. Okay, I can go first. Um, I would just want to say thank you to WCN for this opportunity today to provide a closer look at our work. Um, it's really nice to be able to share what, what's happening here and uh, the updates, um, the encouraging updates. So thank you so much for that. And um, yeah, I just uh, if keep following our work uh, and uh, we, we hope to expand this program 
um, within the site currently um, and to be able to expand it to other places to trial it out because as we we go from place to place you know we're always talking to local fishers and um, yeah we we do get reports that, oh yeah you know I know that my friend is uh, getting quite a bit of bycatch in his nets and stuff like that but these are areas that we're not currently operating in so um, yeah we we hope for everybody's support um, and we hope that we are able to do more through this program and of course through all the other programs that we do as well research and outreach and one of the things is not just about trialing the pingers but to kind of get the word out as well and to continue to strengthen our um, marine outreach and education programs here in Malaysia to increase ocean literacy among students and young people in the country. So um, we appreciate everybody's support. Keep following us on our social media um, and uh, through, through WCN's channels as well. And um, I will be at Spring Expo at Redwood City uh, next month. Um, and so I hope to meet some of you there. Yeah, I'll just also add on and say thank you so much to WCN for the support and everyone that attended today. Thank you for being here. And yeah, it would be uh, amazing if you could also share the work that we do and follow us on social media to see uh, more of the things that we do. Thank you. Great. Thank you both so much. I know they are joining us on their Saturday morning, so we are super appreciative that you are here with us, um, just sharing your knowledge and your passion. A few things before we wrap up. Um, we have another closer look next, um, sorry, not next month, in two months from now, May 17th at 10 a.m., Pacific time with one of our newest partners, Proyecto Washu in Ecuador. So there will be a link in the chat to register to that. Um, if we didn't get to your question or any other comments, please, um, you probably have noticed Megan, again, in the chat has been um, helping moderate her emails in the chat. You can get in touch with her and she would love to help you out. And lastly, as Louisa mentioned, please save the date for the Wildlife Conservation Expo, which is coming up on April 20th in Redwood City, California. We'll have Louisa there and a handful of other incredible conservationists who will be speaking. You can get all the information for WCN Expo at wcnexpo.org. Um, and we are just, we will be thrilled to see you there. And with that, I just want to say thank you again to everyone who joined. And I hope that you have a great Friday evening or Saturday morning, whatever time it is in your time zone. Thank you all so much.